John, it's certainly a privilege to be here, and thank you for inviting me to come back. This is an absolute fantastic venue. Um, my charge today, uh, hybrid approaches to the aortic arch, and I think perspective on this uh, has changed quite a bit over the last few years, and um, TVAR, or endovascular repair, has become an important tool for the cardiothoracic surgeon or cardiovascular surgeon. Um, and it's not just a tool in isolation, but I think it's a tool to make the open operation better, and hence the hybrid approaches. So let's go and get going here. I have about 20 minutes here, I believe, so I'm going to try to take you through a whirlwind tour of what's been happening for the last uh, decade. Here are my disclosures. So what are our options today in 2016? Extensive arch aneurysms are complex anatomy, as you can see here. This is a anatomy in a patient that all of us have seen in the office, and it raises a lot of questions on how we manage these patients. And of course, it's all about patient selection, but these anatomical challenges are sometimes often hard to overcome. Traditionally, open heart surgery, we do, we do it well, but frankly, not everybody's, an op, uh, not everybody's a candidate for these procedures. Why is that? They're technically demanding. It requires complex circulatory management. Often it uh, involves hypothermic circulatory arrest. And as I mentioned, in higher risk patients, morbidity mortality can be quite significant. So obviously the question comes up, this is an audience that is quite friendly to endo as opposed to some of the, perhaps some other audiences that are not, but you can see why some of these patients, frankly, are just not gonna tolerate a traditional open, open arch operation as much as we surgeons love to do these operations. So let's define a little bit what I mean by hybrid arch repair. What I mean by that is really extending the proximal landing zone, zone zero. All of us here, I think, are aware of the nomenclature, but you can see on the picture on the right-hand side, it's divided into zones as we get closer to the arch. It, 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 what I mean by hybrid arch repair are the fo is the following. Number one, a conventional brachial cephalic or arch reconstruction with a concomitant or stage endovascular arch repair, allowing us to land into zone zero. And of course, the idea of this is to eliminate or minimize circuitory arrest time so that we can minimize the morbidity and mortality associated with a traditional arch operation. Now, hybrid concepts are not new to us. Um, when we started doing endografting in, in, uh, in 2005, 2006, um, in early 2000s, uh, to address the left subclavian, we did these. So it is not a new concept to us when it comes to zone two. When we had approval with the Gore-Tag initially in 2006, we were then able to use these devices to attack more aggressive and more, um, um, more um, ominous lesions such as these arch aneurysms where perhaps we can think of a more creative way than open arch surgery. This was our early experience. I was, uh, I was able to have the privilege to present this in 2006 at the aortic surgery symposium in New York. These are very, very sick, high-risk patients, you can see here, are early experience, relatively um, um, good uh, results. It was a proof of principle that we can do these, certainly in high-risk patients. And these are just straightforward sacral arch aneurysm, brachiocephalic uh, bypass, with a delay or concomitant stage endografting of the arch. So that was the beginning of it all, at least at UPenn anyway. Since then, over the last decade, we have learned uh, to do this procedure better, and we have also extended the extent of disease that we can address. You can see here starting from the left to right, or a classification scheme of type one, type two, and type three, starting from the most uh, more, more focal sacral aneurysm in the arch versus aneurysms that extended into proximal aorta, and certainly in the type three, the mega aortas where the aneurysm extended all the way around from the root down to the abdominal aorta. But for the remaining, uh, for the next portion of this talk, I'm gonna focus more on type one and type two, because these are more, uh, more common, at least certainly uh, in the practice we see at Penn. So all of you are familiar with these so-called the branching procedures. Over the last few years, I think we have gravitated further and further away from these procedures. We've known the limitations of these procedures, especially if there is aortic disease in a landing zone. But it, in concept, it's fairly straightforward. You can do a side biter on or off bypass, revascularize the brachiocephalic arteries in a sequential fashion to minimize cerebral ischemia, followed by either a concomitant integrate TVAR 
or you can stage it with a retrograde approach. Fairly straightforward from a technical perspective and conceptually. In the event that the ascending aorta, your proximal aorta, is aneurysmal disease, then you're going to need to create some sort of proximal landing zone in order for this technique or this concept to, to apply. So so-called zone type 2, creating a proximal platform. You can see here in a brief, brief uh, circuitory arrest fashion, now, now this is now going to be more extensive open surgery, you are able to create a platform revascularize your head vessels and then allowing you and giving you a platform, a zone zero, so-called, so that you can come back and deploy a stent graft or do it concomitantly. So this gives you a very, very robust proximal landing zone that is reproducible, that is a zone zero that you can control, i.e. you can choose the size of the graft so that it fits nicely with your distal landing zone and your distal uh, treatment uh, strategy. This is something that a graph that we've used and, and designed uh, here at, at UPenn. You can see here fairly, also fairly straightforward conceptually. You can see there is an endovascular delivering system built into it. Um, is there a pointer here, John? You can see it right here. This allows you to deploy the stent graph without another access point. And as you can see here, a, a three branch. Um, break your suballoc trunk that allows you to revascularize the head. And of course, you can control your platform in terms of both diameter and length to facilitate your distal treatment. This is something just a representative after implantation. You can see here, um, branch of the innominate artery, left carotid, left subclavian, again, you can have complete control of both the diameter and the length of the proximal landing zone, and it really does allow you to have a lot of variability and creativity in how you treat the distal disease. And as I mentioned, then you can either come back concomitantly and do this antegrade or come back retrograde, and it does really provide you a very robust proximal landing zone that you don't really have to worry about in terms of creating a retrograde dissection, IMH, et cetera. Here are some of our early results. This was uh, published in 2013. You can see here, early on, most of the experience were in type ones, but we've gravitated more towards type twos. These are sick patients. You can see here, these are operations. There's no question about it. This is a adjunct to an open operation to make the open operation better. You can see that why we've become less and less favorable to type one, because the stroke rates are high for whatever reasons, probably patient selection. And you can see here, these are just sick patients. Despite getting them through the operation, almost half of them were not alive at five years. So there are, these are patients with significant comorbidities. Questions have always been asked whether we should do all arches this way. Is total arch a thing of the past? And of course, there are always two sides to the story. This is a, just one of many, many studies out there looking and comparing the two techniques. You can see this is a Japanese study looking at open versus hybrid approaches and a propensity score matching analysis. You can see here a mismatch, I'm sorry, excuse me, a, a, um, a variety of patients multiple uh, graphs, platforms, different types of uh, disease, but nonetheless, I think the message uh, is that we are getting better, and you can see here, both in the unmatch and the match group, that the hybrid approach do not do worse, uh, not in terms of stroke or mortality, suggesting that in the right patients, properly selected patients, that it is a viable option as we move forward. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and, and talk about dissections. And my perspective on this has, has changed pr probably over quite, has changed quite a bit over the last five years. And I do think these techniques, these hybrid techniques, can make just as much impact, if not more, in terms of outcome when compared to aneurysmal disease. We all know dissection disease are often tough cases. Patients often come in, extre in extremis, they're often acute, emergent. These are not the aneurysmal elective operations. You can see here, concepts have been developed regarding how to, how to marriage open techniques and endovascular techniques so we can do a better operation. And of course, um, 
along the line with what Dr. Arco had mentioned about branch grafts, I'll mention this a little bit later on, perhaps there will be marriage of not only open surgery and traditional tube graft TVAR platforms, but branch graft platforms and how we address uh, these dissections and perhaps improve outcomes. So just a, going back a little historically, you hear a, a lot about these frozen elephant trunks, elephant trunks, stent elephant trunks. Just a little historical background from the cardiac surgery perspective. What, what an elephant trunk is, you can see here, this was initially described in the early 80s, basically a traditional operation where you can construct the arch and you leave a remnant of a Dacron graph, so-called elephant trunk, so that you can use that as a platform to address the distal thoracic uh, aortic pathology. Fast forward 30 years, we are now using that same surgical concept with these new technologies, the new stent grafts, that allows us to treat the distal aorta in concomitant with a proximal operation, the so-called frozen stent to elephant trunk. And the point that I really wanted to, to make here is that we are learning more and more about this the way order remodel. And I'm not gonna get into too much of that in this talk because of interest in time. But you can see here at Penn in our, in our experience, patients who come in with type A dissections, with malperfusions and extremis, with a distal aortic aneurysm perhaps, you can see how a simple tube TVAR into the distal aorta can make all the difference in terms of distal remodeling and perhaps prevent future reoperation in the thoracoabdominal segment. This is an example of a patient that came in extremis. This was done a few years ago. You can see here a type A dissection acutely, severely compressed true lumen, pseudocarctation with distal malperfusion. And, and this is a technique I think most of us uh, can do with a fairly amount of reproducibility. Um, I like to put a wire in the true lumen just to confirm it because you can see here once your circuitory arrests, here's the open arch. You want to make sure that when you deploy your stent graph in an anti fashion, that you're in the true lumen. I'm going to run this video. Do you mind doing that for me, sir? This is just, uh, for us, something that can be done uh, in a fairly straightforward, simple fashion. You can see here, we're under circuitory arrest, arrest. The wire is identified. We know the wire is in a true lumen. There's no question that this stent graph will be deployed. This is using a gore tag, uh, obviously, um, Demonstrating it's been a few years. It was a gore tag. Uh, you can see the valve of the excuse me the the tag is then deployed. This is fairly just, just fairly straightforward. It only takes a few minutes. It does allow you to address the distal aorta in a fairly quick fashion, as opposed to the traditional elephant trunk, which will require total arch, uh, much more extensive surgery. And once you do that, it's deployed, and you're ready to go. You can see here in the picture, an aggressive hemiarch has been done. And you can see a remnant in that distal stent, and you can just sew to that in a fairly straightforward fashion. You can see here, it does allow the surgeon to minimize the arch operation and perhaps minimize the morbidity and mortality associated with a total arch in an acute type A dissection. There are some post-procedural films you can see affecting distal aortic remodeling, et cetera, in the follow-up imaging. Um, and certainly more uh, is to come. Uh, there are, these are devices in Europe that we certainly uh, currently do not have access to in the United States or in North America. Um, there are ongoing trials I think that will likely hit this, this country soon, uh, specifically the Vascutec Floroflex. You can see here the concept I think is, is valid and hopefully we'll have more information for you in the next few years. But again, using specially designed graphs that allow us to address the distal aorta in a more efficient fashion, as opposed to using something that's not exactly quite designed for this fashion. I'm just going to finish up here for the next few minutes talking about endovascular, total endovascular approaches. I know I want to stick along the lines of hybrid approaches. We're just not quite there yet with the total approach. You, you heard Dr. Arco's talk. Um, we've been fortunate enough to be part of the Gore single limb um, trial. And you can see here, it does have the flexibility to go in the zone zero. So for the, to stay on topic with this talk, I'm going to focus more on the right, the zone zero, where we have total arch reconstruction here using a single limiting nominal artery. 
Here's the side branch uh, platform or the gore. You can see here there's an inner portal that would take the single limb into your brachial cephalic vessel. This is a case that we recently did um, in aortic arch aneurysm. You can see here a patient we felt was not a good candidate for a traditional open arch. Very saccular aneurysm, very saccular pathology. Ideal, I believe, for a zone zero approach with a single limb. So again, we use the same concepts, you know, using open surgery to augment endovascular approach, make our operation better. This is a, a fairly minimal invasive partial stenotomy, double transit, transposition. You can see here the transposition of the left carotid to the nominate and subsequently the left subclavian to the left carotid. This could be done through a small incision through a, uh, and relatively with, with relatively low uh, morbidity and mortality. You can see here, here's the end result. Early on, uh, this is a learning curve. We gotta make sure there's enough landing zone for your limb so that you do not cover your left carotid. Believe it or not, that was not so obvious to us, even though it should have been. But you can see here, this is a critical portion of this procedure. You gotta make sure you create a landing zone for your single limb. Here's the case. Please run the video, there you go. Uh, a distal a C tag was deployed to set up the platform. You can see the saccular arch aneurysm. Then your branch main devices advance up. There is some alignment that is required to make sure that the portal's on the outer curve so that you can engage your, your side branch, and in this case, the innomin artery. Once you have confidence that the portal is aligned appropriately, let me see if I can point to that here. Here's the portal. A through and through technique into the innomin artery is then done, and of course, the, the device is deployed. A side limb is then advanced into place, and then subsequently deploy in a fairly straightforward fashion. And here's the completion in geography. You can see here, again, using traditional surgical techniques, a double transposition, followed by a new technology, a single limb, allowing us to give this patient a, a very, very robust hybrid approach to treating an arch aneurysm. Otherwise, could be associated with fairly high morbidity and mortality in open surgery. And of course, new devices are coming, dual branches, and perhaps one day we'll get there where total endovascular approaches and treatment of arch may be here. Maybe sooner than we think, I'm excited about that, but more to come on this platform. So in conclusion, um, arch pathology obviously remains a complex clinical challenge. It does require, I, I, I strongly believe, a, a, a comprehensive multidisciplinary aortic approach, aortic team approach is important. At UPenn, the aortic team includes a cardiac surgeon, a vascular surgeon, echocardiography, cardiologist, neurologist. I think that's the aortic team uh, is how we've done it since the 90s, and I think it continues to prove to be successful. Obviously, the open arch repairs remains the gold standard, at least to this point, that all arch hybrid repairs or endo repairs must be compared to. It does provide us a benchmark because the results in low risk patients are still very good. So I want everybody to keep that in mind. And of course, in selective patients, landing in zone zero or creating a zone zero platform may be the preferable approach for extensive arch aneurysms. And of course, as I mentioned, perhaps the future branch anographs will continue to advance her field and improve outcomes for a patient. Thank you.